Welcome to the Buried Dreams Podcast. I'm your host, Elle Morris. This episode, we have Stetra, producer, DJ, and co-founder of Technorotica. Technorotica's goal is to help grow and evolve the underground music culture in Dallas. Their intentions are placed in artistry, creativity, community, and inclusivity at its heart. For artist content and news on the latest Buried Dreams, follow us on Instagram at Buried Dreams Podcast. Enjoy. I love the name Technorotica. You're one of the founders, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And where did the name come from, Technorotica? So my friend Micah and I, this is back when we were working with Lola Presents. So it was another production um, artist collective that our friend had started. And that's kind of where we found our common passion in the music industry, just events production, show bookings, and we're just hanging out, talking about it's like one of those like daydreamings where you're just, you know, tossing back ideas with friends and say, oh, that's how it always starts. What if, uh, you know, what if we did this? You know, what would we call us? And there is a, I think, a pair of headphones and it's techniques. Mm-hmm. And we always talked about sort of what we're just saying, like more of the underground type of events that isn't so, I wouldn't say like mainstream or commercialized, but it's like erotic in a sense and not saying it's sensual, but it draws you in. You're not quite sure what piques your interest in that, whether that be art, music, visuals, or lifestyle, but it's, you know, it intrigues you and it, it brings you in. So then we tag that on to, you know, oh, Technorotica. That sounds nice. It's available. It is. We'll yeah. just, we'll just grab it just in case. Wow. Yeah. Did you guys uh, go through any sort of process to, what is it called when you so in the process of trademarking it, but it was a very organic growth to where we are now. And that was something that we always wanted to have stay true in the process, like not to force things, you know, mm-hmm. things happen as they should. I love that you brought that up because I feel like I'm kind of dealing with that now. It's trust the process as it's so cliche to say. Someone came, told me one day, it's like, what if you just had it all just like then and there it's like when people get to that point they look back at the journey and they're like wow like I'm so glad that I grew through this journey I made it to this spot but if you just have it all then like what does it all really mean and yeah it's like you have to pour yourself into the process and love it and people will see that authenticity and passion in it but if you're just doing it to get big I think that can destroy the product. Absolutely. Intentionality is one of um, Technorica's core values. And it's, you know, whatever we do, there's intention behind it. It's not like done out of like obligation or because like, you know, this is what the majority of society is doing, but really what, what is your most authentic self? And like, how would you present that in an extended way? So I think with Technorica, you know, wanted to become a platform for not just musicians, but different artists and whatever mediums they create, you know, what's something that they've always wanted to showcase that, you know, they weren't able to express in the past, something that they can present to the audience that's a little bit different, a little educational, and also share something that, you know, we collectively like. So that's Technorotica is a play on words too. I think techno is kind of your, as you're diving into underground dance music, you go through like EDM, you dig a little deeper and then you're like, oh, what's all this? Yeah, that's how it was for me. I started with EDM and just a little taste, but I used to not like electronic music. What type of music did you used to listen to? I listened to a lot of rap and hip hop. Same. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that was just how I grew up. So we listened to a lot of rap and hip hop and like, you know, early 2000s kind of music. Mm -hmm. And yeah, when I moved to Europe, like that's all I wanted to listen to. Like when I go out, I want to listen to that kind of music. And all they had was electronic music, or at least the people that I was hanging out with, they all wanted to go see electronic. So I would go out and I would feel dissatisfied, you know, because you're like searching for that. But after a while of like, that's all you have, you start to grow to really like it. And I mean, I was listening to like Skrillex or something like that Mm -hmm. um, or Trap because Trap has that strong hip hop influence. Mm -hmm. So I like that kind of music. But yeah, I think I first started getting into house music 
because it's a little bit more dancey. I mm-hmm. didn't really understand techno that much. Mm-hmm. But then I started really getting into tech house mm-hmm. and that kind of transcended me into the realm of techno, which I now I really love techno. Like house music I love as well. Mm-hmm. I think it's a great like uppity double D's type of, you know, pop in, you can chat mm-hmm. or you can dance if a good song comes on. It's like very lively, but mm-hmm. I feel like techno kind of gets into your soul. It does. And it's very cathartic. And it's, I think, the hardest question for me to answer when I first entertained, okay, I'm going to start mixing music and it's, you know, what style do you want to spin? Mm-hmm. And, you know, coming from Arkansas, I found a very small pocket niche house music scene and I... In Little Rock? In Little Rock, Arkansas. Were you living there or were you living in a smaller town? I was living in a smaller town, um, moved to Little Rock because I um, I actually used to play collegiate golf. And so once upon... What is that? I used to play golf um, for a division one college. And then for a while, that was my life goal. I was going to, you know, play golf professionally, went to spend a good decade on that went to school and that's really where I fell in love with music and just kind of like the energy that comes with the nightlife industry. Mm -hmm. And then I made an active choice. I'm like, okay, well, I can't excel at academics, excel athletics, and also excel at this. At that time, I was like, well, I'll choose excel in academics. Golf might take a back seat. Um, I really want to entertain this creative outlet of music. I used to paint and I used to want to like open a gallery, shifted, did golf. And then music really brought back that creative like drive and passion. And it's like you always come back to your root Mm -hmm. and what drives you. And it kind of manipulating emotions, using sound and just seeing the effects that that has on a mass of people and have the effect of pausing time and letting everyone be in that moment together is like probably the most magical thing that you can do like on this end and it's like the ultimate high so since doing music asking that question of what style do I want to play it really depends on my set and setting and like my headspace and my mood I always wanted to be able to have the skill set and mix whatever type of music with whoever I was playing with I think when I first started mixing that was like a okay whoever I play with I want to have like the musical knowledge and the skill set to mix and go back to back with them and have it be complimentary. How do you increase your music knowledge? I'm not sure how to answer that, but I do have my family to thank for that because they listen to just a wide range of music. And so my upbringing was listening to rap and hip hop and R&B with my sister, you know, classic rock or blues. And then my parents listened to disco, house, new wave. and Wow. Just like a, a range of music. And I think that's definitely carried over in adulthood. So I I try to take all of my musical likes and try to pocket it in a cohesive manner. So it's just not all over the place. And from that, I kind of started my own, I guess, like personal mix series. I'd like to grow that further, but it's in motion and it's emotion always in motion. So depending, you know, where I'm playing, the set, the setting, who's attending, that really dictates the type of set that's going to be played. I think that's amazing that you're able to adapt. And one thing I've always wanted to do, not always, but in the recent years is DJ. And I feel like my music knowledge is Mm -hmm. not there. And if you're a DJ, you need to have a breadth of music knowledge about history and about artists and but also no tracks and you need to constantly be digging through tracks and maybe focusing on like a few artists at a time and kind of digging through who they are and like Mm -hmm. really getting to know their music and it takes time I mean there's so much out there so much and with the recent just age of technology there's too almost too much music it's impossible to keep up with like almost what's new and music is so genre fluid now I laugh at myself because it's always like an ongoing list of I'll get my music organized and it's such a daunting task because once you get down to it it's really hard to categorize the music because there's three categories in each song (laughs) yeah I actually saw a Venn diagram and it was like all of the main like staples and genres of music but there is like almost 10 to 20 subcategories of each one yeah and subcategories regional too based on like where in the world that music was being played but definitely a lot of research and just history and it's, it's almost immersive so if you're looking at the history of music and 
you read the history behind it and the context and like how music was used during that time has a different effect of you. Like when you play it, it's almost like that music and that story that was made at that time is now speaking through you as uh, you know, when you're performing. Yeah. I was living out in Europe for a little while and how did you, I feel like your music has a very strong European feel to it. It's very clean and crisp and uh, well, these are the shows that I've experienced, especially at Virgin Hotels. Are you guys still having a residency there or was it just last year? It was just last summer. Um, we currently don't have a residency there, but was really thankful for the opportunity. It was a beautiful space and just having that constant cadence of events that we did, it was a lot of work, but also very rewarding to see, you know, friends like you and like everyone come out weekly and we just to show support. Fans. Thank you so much for coming out. It really made, you know, on the other side, it looks like we just throw shows and it's a lot of fun and there's like so much work and effort that goes behind it. But once we see like our friends having a good time, new faces come out and, you know, say, hey, thank you so much for putting this on. It makes everything so like rewarding and worth it just to provide that space and that moment for people to release, maybe escape or maybe, you know, have some sort of like therapy, um, whether that's through sound movement or dance or just like socializing. It's really rewarding to be able to provide that space. So that's an intentionality, I guess, behind it for the event production side. Some of my favorite memories were last summer at Virgin Hotels. I mean, the ambiance is really nice. It's Mm -hmm. usually not my, you know, hangout grounds. I usually go to more like dark dungeon-y type places. But the crispness of your techno music and the space were very compatible and it called for a very good time. Thank you. I really like purely danced at those events that was something that we wanted to try and i'm not sure if educates the right word but with the climate i guess here in the western states you know dance music is not part of like the culture yet it's getting there it's still in pockets but like how you said when you move to europe you got immersed in that culture and maybe it wasn't something that before really interested you but because everyone didn't see it as taboo and it was just part of like the day-to-day you found kind of like that beauty in it so it's kind of what we're trying to do like in Dallas and it doesn't have to be a dark dungeony place for that music to be played Mm -hmm. there's honestly so many different facets of house and techno that can be played you know at daytime spots they can play played in like speakeasy lounges where it's a more intimate like dance floor. You just finished up your takeover at Double D's. How was that? It was great. I was really, really excited to have the team in there. Big shout out to uh, one of my best friends, John, that's on the team. He's the Sunday resident at Double D's. But our friend, Jeremy, when he opened up the space and, you know, I got to get a look at what the vibe they were trying to create. And it really reminded me of Beauty Bar um, location, the original one off Greenville or sorry, on Henderson, and just to have like a a very warm, eclectic group of people that comes in and no matter like what's playing, like they vibe out too. And it's always good energy, like the people that come in. I I feel like Double D's has done a good job at, you know, capturing that and playing to that room. It's an intimate spot, but you see all walks of life come in and just to have that sense of like cohesiveness, you know, listen to funk, disco, house. It's a really cool like atmosphere. It's different than being in like a a nightclub or like a show setting. It's like being at a house party. So you have a more personal like connection with everyone. It's very social. Mm -hmm. I feel like anyone that I go up to and speak with, they're very open and they'll make eye contact with Mm -hmm. you. No one's trying to close off. And the way that they have the space open it's very much like house party like with the couches and you have the little tables in the middle but people are dancing around those two big tables so Mm -hmm. at the same time everyone's mixed together and you also see a very diverse group of people very but I think overall everyone's looking pretty clean and nice you know it's a very like trendy group of people that comes in and like I said it's like people from all different walks of life which I think is really cool because Dallas is such a melting pot but you'll have your little Absolutely. spots that seem a little bit um you know segmented there's like a, a certain group that they're catering to but I love the double d's really caters to like the whole city um, yeah it, it really, really does a, like a it's like a family vibe there yeah every time I go I have a great time you just played for one night 
We did. And we're talking with them about doing another night soon. So that is to be announced, but it should be here in a couple of months. But we'll share details though once that's confirmed. What do you think is great or lacking about Dallas? Great or lacking? I think great is we do have such an immense amount of talent here in the city. Um, what's lacking, I think, is the sense of community and just connectivity between the different like creative groups. I feel like just as a city in itself, infrastructure wise, it's very segmented. Um, you know, you have to drive 15, 20 minutes to get to different parts of the city. So. I do like that though. I like being able to go to Bishop, East Dallas. We have a lot of different neighborhoods that have very different atmospheres and you can kind of get what you're looking for in the night. It doesn't have to be the same thing every single time, but it is true that each neighborhood is about 10, 15 minutes out, but I don't think that bad, especially going from it's like not. the farthest side to, you know, let's say East Dallas neighborhood traveling to Bishop Arts mm -hmm. could be a biggest gap and that's 10, 15 minutes. I think it's not bad. Yeah, no, it's definitely not bad. I think um, if there was a way that the communities could like collaborate more with each other instead of just staying in their own pocket, um, I think that's something I would like to see more. Maybe like a blending of cultures because the cultures blending. are so distinct in each of the neighborhoods. They are, which is what makes it like super unique and special. But I would love for the Dallas, it's very pro-business for it to be pro-culture and, you know, pro-community. I hear, you know, we were talking earlier about a lot of groups that we've been talking to individually have expressed. There's not really a sense of like community in Dallas and people who move here, I tend to hear they have to look pretty deep to find, you know, like where's the spots to go? Like where's the good music? You know, where's arts? And just finding that sense of local community, it's a bit hard to find. So if there's a way... I mean, I've taken on personally, you know, with our team, you know, how to leverage community and create dialogue with all the other collectives. But there's a way to just put culture in the forefront. And, you know, there's a lot of cool things to do in Dallas, albeit we don't have much nature. And, you know, we're more than just bars and bottle service clubs. Like there's an actual like culture here. So that's something I would like to see more of. I feel like us being in the mainland of uh, the coastal cities, we're always going to be a few years behind from everyone, but really just embrace like our sense of identity and stop trying to be insert any other city. Yeah, I do feel like everyone, not everyone, but I hear people say they want us to mimic Chicago or mm -hmm. mimic in New York or LA. There's so many people moving here, but mm -hmm. I tend to see people will move here, spend three, five years and say, uh, I'm not as inspired as I was when I came here. I need to change yeah. the scenery. And then, you know, I've had friends move, you know, up back to New York or, you know, elsewhere. Basically just saying the city is uninspiring. Yeah, well, we were talking about how Dallas, we were trying to mimic other mm -hmm. cities. And I think it's just like authenticity with yourself. If you try to be other people, it's not going to work. And mm -hmm. people are not going to receive that. And if you're authentically yourself, people will receive that and enjoy it in a much better way. And you're also going to enjoy it yourself. And I do think that Dallas has its own personality. Absolutely. I used to joke. I felt like Dallas was like going through its adolescent years and just trying out like, you know, different phases, <laughs> different vibes. Yeah. It's like coming out and like trying to find like what your person is. I feel like Dallas has gotten better just in the like decade that I've lived here. I've seen as the city makes strides, like it might not look like we've made much of a difference to people who've moved, who've only been here for a few years, but compared to like 10, 20 years ago, I think we do have a healthier creative community. I just would like to see that kind of fast tracked here in the, you know, the coming years. What do you think uh, some solutions are to bringing awareness to what's going on in the community and emphasizing the culture? You know, I feel like dialogue with city officials is definitely needed as much as everything, you know, we we almost are drawn to the underground nature of the arts. But I feel like some of that underground nature needs to be educated to people who may not know about the culture. And I think it's that educational dialogue that's needed. There's a correct way to do things where it benefits like everyone and it pushes a connected front forward and you know the city we want to be you know put our spot on the map and you know we're the next 
insert any other destination city. Like Mm -hmm. we have that while we don't have oceans and mountains, we have some of that aspect, but culturally, I feel like if we all banded together, um, we would just make a stronger, you know, make a stronger argument for, you know, why Dallas can be inspiring. And I feel like there's a lack of, I think something that is great about Dallas is that we do have things going on, Mm -hmm. but like we were saying earlier, you have to really dig deep with these different groups of people to really have varied scope of what's going on around the city week to week. And I feel like there needs to be a place where people can come and see what is going on. There was a magazine that Dallas used to have and they Mm -hmm. used to post all of the, right, all of the different music events that were happening or art events Mm -hmm. inside this single magazine. And you know, it was back in the day, you know, magazines were cool and, Mm -hmm. you know, people were utilizing them and it was successful until the internet came around. And I wonder if like having an online meeting place for EDM events or art events would be great. So people, there's more connectivity between all of the different scenes. Absolutely. I think that definitely is a necessary component just to further that dialogue and just to you know bridge the different communities together. I think there's all of the communities in themselves do a good job of advocating for, you know, activations or events that they're a part of. But it might be, I don't know how to tackle this, but I'm, I'm trying to do it on a small scale. And maybe, you know, it's all of our friends and everyone that we know in the creative community. We kind of take this on as a group project. And yeah, like an open like a, source like project. Artist depository of, you know, mm-hmm. what's happening in the city. You know, you see other cities and they have these, you know, mass um, events that bridge business, technology, art and community together. And I feel like Dallas doesn't really have, you know, an event that caters to that. Like we have like smaller activations, you know, if like Aurora is doing something or DMA or Contemporary or any of the other museums. Um, But as a city, I don't see that. More independent. It's more independent. I don't, you don't see like a citywide initiative. I think the recent project I worked on with the creative company I'm a part of, uh, Anpol, last year we got to work with the Canadian consulate and the city of Dallas and some of the galleries uh, in Dallas. Um, So like the Cedars and then also downtown Dallas Inc. But it was for an art project, but bridging as a cross borders project, basically honoring the history that we have with the Native Americans. Um, While it be a dark past, this is kind of our way of honoring that and how we can do better and also creating dialogue of, you know, the generations that lives here. But it was like back then you would have cave paintings and these ancient arts as a way to communicate what was going on at that time. And so we thought, what would be a way that we can do our own modern cave painting? Hmm. And my friend and another artist that he worked with from Canada, he they created a um, augmented reality sculpture. So it was in the ether, sort of say, but we tied it to a physical piece. But this was shown at the at t Art Gallery and the DMA. But it was probably the first time I've worked with, you know, different groups, especially city officials. And you could hear the excitement about the arts and about bringing communities together. There is a want there to do something that's unique and cool and pushes artistry forward for the city. So... If there's a way to get more funding to do that and to bridge, you know, different segments of the city together, it'd be really neat to see. There's, you know, almost like a South by Southwest, how Austin has, if Dallas could also curate something similar. Yeah, I think that there's not an absence of funding in Mm -hmm. Dallas. There's a lot of money here. Absolutely. But there is a gap between the artist and I would call them the artistic people who are, they're more fancy if that makes, I don't know how to. It's almost like gatekeepers to yeah. their segment of the industry. Mm-hmm. and They have the money and they're wanting to give it out to the community, but there is some sort of barrier between the art community and how these, you know, officials and these people with money, how, I don't know, there's just like a separation in culture mm-hmm. between the two groups. And I think they want to reach out, but they're waiting for people to reach out to them. And I don't think that people typically take the initiative to reach out to them. 
Absolutely. I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. I think they're looking for individuals to be more proactive, you know, and seeing who comes to them. So I would like to see if there's a way to, to for the community to come together um, on a united front. You know, we're all trying to do the same thing. You know, everyone wants to make a living creating art. But I think if everyone does it together, and that's just like a more, it's a stronger front. We'll have it'll probably yield better results than doing it individually. You know, we're not competing against each other. And I think that's... That's very climactic. I think Mm -hmm. a lot of us feel that competition and it sucks. But at the end of the day, there's room for all of us to succeed. Absolutely. You know, there's just such an influx of people also moving, you know, to the city, you know, daily. I think it was like in the last like recent years we've had, you know, like over like... Three or 400 a day. Yeah, 300, 400 a day. Everyone's moving, you know, to the outskirts of the city. Mel Wolf is launching up in, you know, Grapevine. So there's all these really cool, creative projects blooming from the city. And I think people are just like not in the know. So what are your plans for this summer regarding your music? Personally, I am working on putting more time forth in production with running a business and also playing out it's you almost have to just schedule production time so i would like to release an ep working on a couple of tracks right now my good friend chris that's on the team false peaks he's had a recent release that's been charting so he's been a huge help on the production front so it's almost like working out you have to get into a cadence and a rhythm and then you know you start to get into a routine what does charting mean charting so it means that it placed in like a top 10 top 20 on the music charts what kind of music charts his was on the new releases for minimal house i believe and what kind of product music are you looking to produce um on the ep so my first ep will probably be a mix of the music styles that i enjoy so it'll be a little bit of a mixed bag i love lo-fi hip-hop i love soulful you know house music disco always and then you know i i have a love for techno and minimal so i i want to say it'll probably be maybe kind three to five tracks um that will touch you know on each one of those genres and then how my mixes i like to kind of ebb and flow between you know all of those genres it'll be something very similar so that's at least what i aim to do as a collective for technorotica we are starting up our mix series again so each one of the artists each month will have a special guest mix and then further on the road we'll start introducing you know more local artists as well but we are confirming a couple of dates that we have for our next takeovers right now it's pending but we should have an announcement here in a couple of weeks so stay tuned um, on our socials to find out yeah you were telling me before that you were spending a lot of time working and there wasn't a lot of balance between the art form as well and creating. So it's nice to hear that this summer you're focusing on bringing some balance into the mix. Yeah, work-life balance has always been a challenge just with, I'm sure you can relate. You You have to recalibrate sometimes. Exactly. So I'm, I'm treating this as, you know, like a workout routine, you know, have a day each week that you get to work on a certain project, what that might be. With music as a focus, I have like a love for painting and just like arts in general. So it's fun dipping back into that again. Very nice. You guys just match the vibes and really bring it every time. Thank you. That is, I, that makes me happy to hear. That was like our intention. And it's when we walk into a space where I was like, okay, what do we hear when we walk into this? Like what, what can we see happening and what flavor of technorotica can we bring into this space? So when people walk in, they're like, this feels like a technorotica, like, you know, curated event. Mm-hmm. And it's, I always want to play on that. You're not quite sure what's drawing you in, but it sucked you in. You're staying there and it's piqued your interest and you want you want to explore more of it. Definitely want to explore more of it until till the lights come on at 9 a.m. <laughs> well, thank you for always supporting us. It's always, like I said, I love seeing friends like join. It's I'm always so busy like working. So when we do our events, that's really like my time to like almost reconnect with friends or like hang out. So whether that's selfish reasons, I kind of pile on all my like friend hangs of like, hey, come out to an event. Let's hang out. It's a great way to hang out when you're so busy. But you said you have three jobs. 
So working as a marketing manager at TRG Concepts, that's majority of my day. And then I'm also a producer for Anpool. It's a creative company. We've done like an AR art installation with Canadian, the Consulate General, and then City of Dallas. And then more recently we were involved um, with the Coachella AR visuals that were on the live stream. What is AR? Augmented reality. Very cool. So it's cool to see, be a part of events and productions, but like in a different light. And I'm always like a sponge. I like to learn what new like mediums that you can create in. And it's, it's one of my friend's company that he's worked with us on some of our Technorotica um, activities. But at the end of the day, it's just nice to kind of work on art and creative projects with friends. It makes the process and journey like really rewarding and just more enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're human beings are made to create and this corporate world can be very soul sucking, but it is how we have our society and how we are stable. So there is a need for it, I guess. I feel like if everyone in the world was just a creator, we wouldn't have food. <laughs> you know? Probably not. We'd have some creative food though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. We'd have people who want to cook it. <laughs> but, you know, I think every, you know, creating can be in all different forms. Creating can be people who garden and grow food and yeah, I mean, even in the corporate world, creating is present. And there's a lot of times, even with data science, that I'm creative and I have to think of solutions. And that's really fulfilling to me. But definitely, I am jealous that you are working in all these creative fields. And were you ever in a corporate position? I was. So I have a background in marketing um, and business administration. So when I graduated and moved to Dallas, I jumped into an agency role. So it was mostly account management is what I did for, I was with the company about four and a half years with two layoffs. <laughs> so I got laid off and then I joined the company back again. And then the second round of layoffs happened and that really propelled me. Let me just try being just a full-time creative. And how are you surviving um, as a full-time creative and um, how does that compare to, you know, being in the corporate world? It definitely was a challenge and I am thankful of the first corporate role that I had was account management because I felt like I really utilized just the project management side of things. Once you're when you're a full-time creative, your business, but you're all components of your business. And it's a one person role wearing, you know, 10 different hats. And I think having that time flexibility to work on art was really rewarding. And I got to find a lot of myself during that time period that I wasn't in corporate. But I think in the last couple of years, I have been kind of like itching to get back into a corporate role. Just so like we were talking about in financial stability earlier, that's, I think when you're driven to create, to maintain that financial stability, it creates another kind of problem in itself because you're not necessarily taking on all the projects that you would fully want to take because it's the financial component driving that decision then you're kind of the same position of, okay, you don't have as much time to work on the stuff you need because you're working on this other creative work that That's is kind of providing you know, financial support for you. So then I think the main battle that I had to get over mentally was the grass is not always greener on their side. And instead of saying, oh, I'm stuck at an office job working for someone else and when I could be doing whatever I want, changing that mindset and saying, this job is providing me the financial security so that when I'm not here, I can fully focus on whatever I want to create without having outside driving force that kind of, I would say, I guess like muddy the waters, you know, for that creative like thought process. So of creating just for the joy of it, you're creating, oh, yeah, I want to find joy in it, but it also needs to make me some money too. Yeah, but it's really interesting that perspective you just brought up. I am really thankful for the job security and mm -hmm. the financial security that I have from my corporate job. Mm -hmm. But it's so funny, like thinking into the future, I don't see myself, I'm doing that for the paycheck. Mm -hmm. And when I think about my future, I think about the things that I'm creating and the things that I'm involved in and seeing that as like what I'm working towards mm -hmm. and 
of course, it's almost like my corporate job is investing into my creative hobbies. Absolutely. Because a lot of it, it's like I pay a lot of money out of pocket each month, you mm-hmm. know, just to keep the podcast afloat and, mm-hmm. you know, be able to manage time. And because sometimes I have to outsource things. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, I guess having that sort of security has been really incremental in, in my creative path. So I'd like to switch gears and talk about you being sober and your journey. Thank you. So yeah, it really started with my girlfriend. She was a former addict and then did all this amazing work and was sober. Um, And when we met, that really, you know, kind of made me sober curious. You know, I would like partake, you know, like especially with like all the after partying. But it got to a point where... I didn't like having like, you know, that hangover the next day or having like snippets of the night before where you like you couldn't remember and seeing her be sober. I was like, let me try. But still being involved, but still being involved. And that was, I think, the other question that I I wanted to kind of overcome was, are you dependent on these vices to enjoy, you know, your craft to perform well? Like, are you reliant on this? And I never want to feel reliant on something so I took it on as kind of a personal challenge I was like let me try you know like she's doing it I want to be supportive I want to be you know not make her feel comfortable and especially I want her to come out to my events and I was like if I can do it you know this can show that we can both still find joy and you know still find that magical all of being in a dance floor in a full room but be completely stone cold sober you get a social high from it Yeah, no, absolutely. People ask, are you okay? And I'm like, I honestly feel like sometimes like kind of high. I definitely looking back used, you know, alcohol and different vices as like a social lubricant being out. I have learned I'm very much an extroverted introvert. So just being out and social, like it is, it does take on energy. Um, But I find myself having more energy now that I don't really drink. I might have like a glass of wine, like with my parents. But in that, like, pretty much, you know, sober, like having that clear mindset is, you know, equally as like a high to me. My mixing and just processing the music is like better. It's quicker. Um, it's more concise. And I feel like my overall, like my sets have, you know, gotten better um, since I'm not drinking. It takes a little bit of a, a social curve to get past the... It does. Um, you go down before you go up. To, like, tolerating being you know with um you know friends who might like be inebriated and not feeling hate to say like annoyed but now after that couple months it's gotten better now so it's playful I look forward to seeing out my friends at a party it's you know it's still exciting to me and then I don't have to worry about like not being able to drive home or like feeling like the the next day I go home I eat that's my after party now it's like a big like dinner I can't go like all night like I used to, but that's okay. Sleep is cool. Yeah, sleep is cool, but it, it's like cool because you listen to your body. And I've tried to go to the after hours. Like I've done two periods of sobriety mm-hmm. and I was going to the after hours one night and I was like really trying to like mm-hmm. stick it out and just like, I'm going to really try hard. I was like falling asleep in the chair. I was like, <laughs> all right, it's time to go. Hey, when your body's done, it's done. And like no reason to like push into overdrive if it's literally saying, hey, you know. It's time. It's like, I'm not even enjoying myself anymore. But you can do a chair dance. I'm, you know, I'm all about like sitting down and doing like grooving in chair. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, I feel like, you know, in the scene too, there's a lot of drugs that go around. And Mm -hmm. I feel like alcohol also, alcohol influences the use of other substances. Absolutely. Especially to keep going too. Mm Mm-hmm. How do you do your after hours with sobriety? So, you know, it's a lot of prep. It's sleeping for 12 hours, you know, the night before, knowing I'll probably be awake for the next 24 hours. And I kid myself, I was like, you know, this is nothing. I used to do this on top of like going to work on like two to three hours of sleep. That sounds like way exhausting. So now doing it sober is, I wouldn't say like, easier there's different challenges in both but i love that i'm more present and mindful i mean especially seeing like new you know new faces that are coming out i bring snacks i bring food to the club like i you'll see me like eating like fries or like a power bar like in the middle Mm -hmm. i've been like jamming on celsius drinks or like you know 
Red Bull's fine, but Celsius, I don't know what they have in there, but it literally will keep me up like all night if I have one. But yeah, just, you know, healthy prep, sleep, working out more, definitely have more just like overall sustained energy. Music, just being on a dance floor with people, like that's just almost like energy like in itself. So it's as long as the music is there, like I'm fine. But yeah, it's not for everyone. It's very taxing. It's It can be hard. I mean, the one thing for me is like, when I first uh, went go sober, the first time I tried, I didn't go out at all. Mm-hmm. Like I wasn't socializing. I was just staying in every weekend and resting. Mm-hmm. But the second time I was like, you know what? I want it to be sober and also like go out and, mm-hmm. and be a part of the scene. Mm-hmm. And when I did it, I was feeling like a, so much anxiety, you know, just knowing that I couldn't have a drink and being in a social situation. I was dependent on alcohol to you know, lubricate, as you put it, the situation and help myself like get comfortable. But after like a couple of weeks of doing that, I got to a point where I was getting like social highs, like going out and being sober. But then after like, I do it for like six weeks and by the six week mark, I started to feel like a very strong thing inside of me. Like I want to do it again. And then I just got back into it. But that's great. Yeah, it's great to like go on those little breaks just to challenge yourself because we do grow dependencies on substances, whether it's caffeine, alcohol, mm-hmm. sugar, tea, Adderall, I mean, yeah. whatever it is. You People grow dependencies on sugar. Yeah, absolutely. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> but I like the idea of going through a day without any substances. Mm-hmm. And that's everything. Just like having good food and good rest. I mean, the, my mental health is so good, but I sometimes I get to the point where I feel a little bit bored, mm-hmm. which I think mushrooms come in. They really help add some spice to the life. Yes, I am very proactive on microdosing, you know, not microdosing to where you're having like psychoactive like effects, but just enough to like elevate your mood and, you know, just to take that anxiety and that edge off. I've been seeing... But even taking like a little bit more like Mm -hmm. in a in a smaller setting or Mm -hmm. like by yourself or with people you trust, it kind of awakens things inside of you that, you know, that may have been bothering you, reminds you of things that are important and that matter to you. So I find a lot of benefit to mushrooms and, you know, the self introspection that it brings. Absolutely. There's a lot of I think everyone has their own like shadow work that they have to walk through. And I think mushrooms are a nice little introductory and it's called a trip for a reason. You kind of have your ups and downs. And um, like you said, that self-introspection point, I think is really important because not everyone gets into that mindset, you know, in their day to day. So having something that actually puts you in that space, I think is important for everyone to experience at least once. Yeah. Do you ever take any time to connect with yourself? And like, what does that look like? I do. That's something I'm trying to do more often now. My girlfriend, she used to tease me that like I, you know, I'm a robot and I like I didn't sleep. And one of the things I say back, I was like, well, I definitely sleep more now I'm with you. And work-life balance has been something I've wanted to improve on. I think having, you know, immigrant parents that came over and didn't necessarily have the best and it was kind of ingrained to me at a very young age that, you know, always work hard, you know, for what you have but also take the time to enjoy, you know, the fruits of your labor too. So what's that like happy medium balance and not stress laxing and, you know, making myself feel guilty for taking a time off or a day off. But I love being out in nature just to reset, you know, taking a walk outside, taking a trip and going to like the mountains or the desert or the ocean is also very like, just like fulfilling, just being in a new space, having a new scenery, but just, you know, spending time with loved ones too. You know, it doesn't, I guess like self-care is not really like a one umbrella for all, but just taking time to appreciate things that you don't normally get to appreciate and just rest, like appreciate smaller things in life. Not everything has to be like a moment or like a crazy activity. It can just be taking a walk outside with your loved ones or reading a book at home. I do, I want to get back more into reading and also just painting. I used to paint when I was younger, always drew and sketched a lot. So that's something I want to get back into. So when I'm not working on music, 
seeing if I still have the creative juices to explore other creative opportunities. It's I'm sure you understand having like a day job. It's hard to like still have the brain power once brain you get power. home. Absolutely. Yeah. So just being cognizant of that. If I'm too tired, I don't force it. But on my days off, I try to, you know, make some time to create. Yeah, I want to get into painting, but I think the thing that scares me is, you know, making brushstrokes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's like, how do I start? Like, do I draw something and pencil on it first and work on that and sketch and then paint over it? Do I just get out there with some paint, just slap it on? I have no idea. It's like, but I think it would be a good practice just to not think, practicing not thinking about what you're doing and just doing it. And like keep doing that. And I think that would train you to just trust whatever your body is telling you to do. Absolutely. When I told you that I used to play golf and that was one of the fundamental things in golf is there's all these mechanics and a hundred things that you're trying to think about your body. Because you think about it, golf is kind of wild because you're doing all of these small moments and it literally takes two seconds and you're trying to propel a small object over across a large distance into a very specific location. So there's a lot of trust that you have to do and just to say, okay, my body can do this. I feel like painting is the same way. I'm different. Like when I paint, I actually like will digitally sketch it out or have some sort of draft. And then if I have like a reference I can look at, then I can pretty much like copy it. My girlfriend, she's really talented and just making fresh strokes on a canvas and having that eye to have like placement and there's a balance ratio. And I always thought, I was like, I wish I could just do it randomly and Mm -hmm. on the spot, but everyone's a little bit different. But does that come with practice, the balance ratio? I think it comes with practice and also personal preference. If you're someone who likes to visually see things before you like executed, that could just be a part of your you know, your artistic process. However, you're more like expressionist and in the moment and whatever you throw down, that's what you throw down. That's a different form of, you know, like style of painting as well. I think both have their unique characteristics. I was listening to, uh, we went to the contemporary and listened to Shepard Fairey's talk. And he was saying a lot of his process is digitized, but he spends a lot of time putting things down, taking it off, putting it back again. And so his editing process has become quite elaborate, but that's how he gets all of his, you know, very complex and layered designs. So it was nice to hear, you know, someone of his like stature say, I wouldn't be where I am or my art wouldn't be what you see without all of this, like behind the scenes, like editing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is he a painter? I would say hobbyist painter. I think when I was younger, I was like, had you know these big dreams I was like oh yeah I'll like paint and I'll you know just open up a gallery wouldn't say that pipe dream has ever like faded but I think it's evolved to I would love to have a space that showcases you know all different medium forms of art I think it's exciting to me when I can host events and have different art mediums involved in the in the curated like night you know having Dora out you know, Adam, and then even like our friends that do our media captures, you know, those are all to me like different forms of art and having them be a part of like Technorotica or like whatever event that we're doing. It's like, here's our blank canvas. This is all of our different styles of art that we're going to throw on it. And we hope you enjoy it or we hope it resonates with you. Yeah, that's the beauty of collaboration, having like different people bring different, you know, perspectives and ideas and bringing it together and showcasing it. Mm -hmm. I think it's so beautiful to see like the collaboration in the arts is I think one of the most creating is fulfilling, but when you collaborate and you come up with a vision together and you execute, I mean, that's so special. Absolutely. I mean, even this, like, you know, like, thank you for having me on. Um, I know, you know, this is just a conversation, but Still, I feel like there's a lot of power with words and just Mm -hmm. hearing these types of conversations, I think, you know, for other people who might not necessarily be in our world or, you know, they might be entertaining it, I think is inspiring for those like people. Um, I think everyone has a creative spark in them. It really just comes down to if they want to entertain it or not. Well, I think that's where I was at, was interested, but 
not entertaining it. Mm -hmm. And I'd never identified as an artist. I thought that I wasn't. And I do now. But my, yeah, that was kind of the premise of starting the podcast is for selfish reasons. So I could get to know artists and their stories and, you know, the struggles and triumphs that they have and, and, and allow it to inspire my own journey. So it's kind of transcended into you know, more complex things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the beauty of the journey is, you know, taking, you know, following that intuition and that thing inside of you. But the hardest thing for me was like the discomfort, you know, starting a new craft that you don't know anything about, but deep inside of your body, you feel like this is something that would, you know, drive you crazy. It's so emotional. It's so... It's a spiritual process, honestly. Oh, absolutely. It's the sense of self is funny. And it's when you hear that little voice, it almost feels like there's two people like battling. You're like, no, don't entertain that. But I'm always like, why not? My dad, my parents recently visited. We They were in town for my grandmother's uh, memorial. She passed in 2005. But since that time, Memorial Day weekend has always been the weekend where the whole family kind of gets together, almost like a family reunion, if you will. Mm -hmm. And my dad expressed to me, he's like, I think I'm going to start DJing. And I was like, oh, oh. And I was like, this is new. I was like, where'd this come from? He's like, is it hard? I was like, I mean, anything that you're going to learn is going to be a learning curve, but you love music. I think you can pick it up. I think it would be a great hobby. And my mom said, you're too old. And I was like, you should be the last person to say that. You're never too old. Exactly. She's funny. My mom actually bought me my first pair of decks. And so my parents have been like, probably my family's been my biggest supporter, supporters in honestly any endeavors that I choose. And really, really lucky to have that. But yeah, you know, my dad, he's always entertained. He's like, I, I like to draw. And I was like, why not? I was like, you can. Who's to say that you can't? My mom, she's like, a master like seamstress used to like design clothing made all of my like prom dresses wow. back when I was in my femme era and you know does these crazy like crochet knitted designs and it's you know to see art and creative drives like in my family like I'm always the no you guys should do that my sister she's a photographer and I've always like pushed for the longest time I was like just be a traveling like photographer but I've had, you know, a lot of opportunities to have her come out and showcase her work. And it's cool. It's cool that I get to have a project that I get to include, you know, not only my friends, but my family in it as well. Yeah. So you are queer. And I kind of want to hear your story about when you found out you were queer or yeah. you decided or maybe you always were. Definitely always was. I for sure was a like tomboy for the longest I wanted to be a boy and actually was supposed to be I was going to be Nicholas Tran they got my ultrasound wrong and so my room was all decked out in blue and then when I was born they're like it's a girl okay so Stephanie but I feel like I don't know if you read like Native Americans folklore they said there's a lot of individuals that have dual spirits and sometimes these dual spirits will be masculine and also feminine energy I think growing into adulthood now, I've come to accept I do have a masculine side and, you know, this is my avatar body, you know, for this realm. So (laughs) I I fully accepted that. But my parents were raised Catholic. I went to private Catholic school, small town in Arkansas. So, you know, not the best like place to like come out to. Um, But I think they've always kind of known when I, you know, went to college and then moved down in Dallas, when I moved down to Dallas is more of like, a, okay, I can do this kind of, I wouldn't say identity change, but seeing my friends and being around like more like queer people made me feel comfortable. Like, okay, it's not weird if I like say anything. And it's been a gradual, I guess, coming out process. I would say the last five years, uh, my girlfriend and I, we've been together for about, you know, two and a half years now. And when I introduced her to my parents, it was a soft, like, this is who I'm dating. She's a girl. And that was my kind of, hey, you know, like I'm gay. And it's like testing the waters and they didn't respond bad to it. They were kind of like, this is a phase. And then after like a few more conversations, it was like, we just want you to be happy and we want whoever, you know, you're in love with to like love you and take care of you. 
but you know, as long as you're happy, like that doesn't change. And it was really nice to hear that from them. And this past weekend, she actually got to meet like that my parents and like the rest of the family. And it was a really, really nice, I guess, like full circle moment of, okay, I can now be my most authentic Myself. self and with someone that I love and not have to like hide that. Yeah, my parents know, some of my family know, probably all of them now because they're talkers. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I think, yeah, that's still one thing that makes me feel uncomfortable is, you know, having a girlfriend around my family. I've never mm -hmm. done that before. Mm -hmm. So it would, I can just imagine them being so weird. You know, you'd be surprised. You know, maybe they won't. I know that we were both kind of, because I told, I shared with her and I was like, I had this is really the second time I've ever brought anyone home. And she's like, wow, okay, no pressure. And I was like, no, 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 you'll be fine. They're going to love you. <laughs> but I think a lot of that was, I think, my own insecurities. I was like, I do hope they love her. And I was like, no, they will. Yeah, it's definitely my own insecurities. So if I can give you some confidence, I think it will go fine. I think our family ultimately just wants us to see us happy. Yeah, and they'll adjust, Yeah. You know? And it, it might be, even if it is weird for them at first, they'll do their best and try not to make it weird. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they don't want it to be weird either. And it's okay if there's like some weirdness, yes. just kind of, yeah, you just know. just write it out. Surf on that bitch. Exactly. <laughs> but now I, um, my friend at Guan, we did like a Hudson conversations and she's like, when did you actually come out? And I was like, I think this is the actual public, like conversation that I've had to like really say like, I am like gay. There wasn't really a, I guess like a, a, mo the a, moment. a moment. I mean, how did you know you liked women? Yeah, I definitely liked women when I was young at five years old, bringing Victoria's Secret magazines into kindergarten. And I got sent home and my parents were like, why is this? I was like, I wanted to show my like, my best friend was a boy. And I was like, I wanted to show him the magazine because I think they're pretty. Yeah. And then I like, I think I proposed to one of the teachers I like would only shop from the boys section. Like I'll have to dig some pictures. And if you want to use for the podcast, there's one of me in like a pretty righteous like jean vest. And just like, I think like these bug, like super sized bugs on these tees. And I think when I was in my adolescent years, like teenage, I think I was like, okay, I'll try to conform, you know, like I'm in this female body. Sure. You know, like I'm trying to make friends. I don't want to make it weird. And I went through like my femme era, but I will say it was almost feeling like I was in drag because I never felt like my authentic self. I would get like compliments and everything, but I was like, uh, it just doesn't feel it right. It doesn't feel right. Like it feels okay, but yeah. it, it never felt like right. And then when I moved here, you know, my queer friends are like, you very much have like an androgynous vibe. And so that made me feel more comfortable to lean more into that. And now I would say like present day, I'm definitely living my most like authentic self and it feels like it feels really nice that I don't have to I guess like downplay it if you will. Yeah I went between I would say I'm more femme mm -hmm. and I had no relationship with my masculine side which is very present mm -hmm. you know and there was a, a last year for like a year I, mm -hmm. I went through mask phase where I cut off all my hair. Okay. And I had a bunch, I went thrift shopping. I bought a bunch of like, you know, boy thrifted type fashion. And I kind of forced myself to kind of stop wearing makeup and like stop mm -hmm. feeling like, you know, pretty. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt like a lot of, you know, being queer recently coming out maybe over the last few years. Before I felt like a lot of my validation of myself and my self-worth was based off of men's validation of me mm -hmm. and that came from my femininity mm -hmm. and me being girly and pretty and I felt like I had no self-worth and so I decided you know in my self-work journey to completely strip that away and get in touch with my masculine self especially now that like I'm becoming more queer and I just I wanted to get to know myself better and I dress more mask and I got to a point where I felt like I was forcing myself to, I had fallen in love with myself and, you know, developed a, a healthy balance of self-esteem. You know, you, I was talking with my roommate, Dora, about, you know, it's normal to have these feelings of guilt of like when you want to stay home and take care of yourself and having these feelings arise 
but you're able to say, hey, I hear you. That feeling is not good. It feels bad, but I'm going to choose to do what's best for me. And so I think that whole experience, like I still have those bad feelings, but I know how to manage them better Mm -hmm. and I know how to balance myself and give myself space to recuperate if I need to and listen. Mm -hmm. And also like getting in touch with that masculine side. I don't feel like I need to be pretty. I don't feel like I have to look any certain type of way Mm -hmm. and still enjoy myself, you know, and not feel like, you know, it was a bad night because I didn't, my hair wasn't right or, or whatever. I didn't get enough attention. Mm -hmm. And so then I decided, I was like, you know what? I feel like I'm kind of forcing myself to be more masculine now. And I decided to, you know, start embracing that femininity again. And it's coming from a much more pure place. Mm -hmm. And it's coming out of like self-expression rather than doing it for other people. Sure. And, And I also still feel like some days I have my masculine days and I feel super comfortable to be that side of myself and be more androgynous. So I do like that feeling of freedom in my gender. It's like, um... I totally get what you're saying because it's like some days you feel a little bit more on this side and some the other, but then you get outside your head and you're like, oh, does it look like I'm just like flip-flopping all over the place to like the outside perspective and like, oh, what era or like what phase is she in Do I need to be in an identity? Do I need to label myself like... No, you don't. Exactly. Some days I feel like I want to like wear this and then it might lean a little bit more femme. But for the most part, I think unlearning that part of me, not that like I regret that was a phase that I had to go through in terms of like growth and to get like where I'm at now. So I appreciate like all of it. But I think how I was when I was younger, like say five to seven was like my most true authentic self. So I'm bringing a lot of that energy now into like my adulthood and trying to like be like you said more forgiving of myself when I have like these intrusive thoughts of like oh I wish like I had like a different body you know like I wish you know I wasn't in this one and just being like more accepted I'm like no this is my body this this is what I have this is what I have I know it's like those thoughts they never go away but it's how you address them when they do come up Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people tell make it seem like you know, one day those things won't they even come in your brain, but I they're feel like there. they're always there. It's just how you talk back to them. Mm-hmm. You'll be like, well, yeah, like you said, that's what I said. I'll have a thought like, I don't want this to be my body. And like, why don't I have what this person has? Mm-hmm. And then and immediately in my head, I'm like, well, there's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing I can do. That's their body too. They probably don't yeah. want it either. There's so many things people could change of themselves if they could. And like I, to make light of it and make myself laugh, I'm like, no, this is my avatar for this game. I don't have enough credits to buy a different skin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, some people have a lot of credits and they can't buy a different this skin. This is true. This is true. You're not wrong. <laughs> yeah. So, but for me, I, um, you know, I want to practice more self like acceptance. So, mm-hmm. you know, as I'm, I feel like coming out is not like a one-stop moment and like that's your, okay, everything's done. I think it's an evolutionary like process and there's a lot of like growth and acceptance that comes with that. Did you ever date a man? I did. Yeah. I actually had like several boyfriends and this is what I meant when it felt like I was just going through the motions just to put a check mark of, okay, this is like how I should be. I'm, I was always like a hopeless romantic. And I think when I got more into the artist creative side, I took on more of a, I wouldn't say a self-serving mindset, but I kind of denounced like love just because I was burned so many times by men. And then when I started dating women, same thing. So I was like, okay, well, it happens on like both sides. It happens on both sides. Yeah, Absolutely. It, yeah. And like was really happy when I met my current girlfriend now because, you know, it felt a cliche when they say like you just know when you know like you feel seen you feel heard you feel like understood and you feel like there's trust there you know there's no I I have to be weary yeah but being with guys I would say when I was younger I think it was love for the sake of love or you know for sake of being with someone I never like loved anyone before it always just felt nice to be with someone with being with guys it always felt like off because I felt like my energy was like matched with them and then when I was with females it felt more comfortable and that's what I was gonna say like I even though you know heartbreak happens on both sides like I also have a past of dating men growing up 
but I do feel like a different comfortability and like ability to be myself with mm-hmm. women. Mm-hmm. Like, and also an ability to go deeper. Mm-hmm. Like I can get really more into my emotional, like deep rolling side mm-hmm. romantically with mm-hmm. a woman. But not to say I haven't felt like extreme romantic sparks with men because I have. But with women, it's just like a different t- sort of feeling of safety. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my um, ifs before, I used to like identify as bi because I felt insecure in saying I was gay. So I used bi as like a transitional term. And for a little bit, it was like going back to what we said, like you have to place a, you know, a box around your identity. Like you have to yeah. be in this defined I am this, I like this. And at the time I didn't know how to express freely without any like hesitation that like, no, I just like women. I think back then I felt like, oh, all of my friends who are girls are gonna like not gonna be friends with me because they're gonna think I've been like hitting on them, which was like not the case. And I got like super in my head. I was like, oh, people aren't gonna like fully accept this. And I was like, I'll just do, you know, my weird version of a, a safe like coming out I'm like oh I'm bi I, I kind of like like both and for a while I try to tell myself that I'm like no I'm definitely lesbian I like women yeah. but it takes that time to get into you know that confident mindset yeah and I I don't even like to call myself a lesbian I like to you can be queer you can I'm just, just be. I feel like I'm queer because mm-hmm. it's like even though I'm more and more I feel like yeah I'm like more into women but I don't want to like put myself in a box and I want to be like free to change my mind Mm -hmm. and free to, you know, love who I feel like I want to love based on a connection Mm -hmm. with a human being and not based off of, you know, what's happening in their pants. But I think it's an energy because sometimes it really is about the human being at the end of the day. Absolutely. It's about the human being. It's about that connection you have and that that attraction, that connection you have to that human being. And I think I am more attracted to feminine based people. Mm-hmm. And and that can come in male form too. Mm-hmm. But it's it has to be special. It's not just like any feminine man or any feminine woman. It's like mm-hmm. there's also has to be that, you know, chemical feeling. Absolutely. We all have our puzzle pieces. Some pieces fit better than others. Mm-hmm. I have no type. Like mm-hmm. It really is an energy thing for me. That's good. I wish most people saw it that way, but energy's big. You feel it. You feel it. I mean, yeah. A lot of the times I'm like, if you were to put a lineup out and told me to pick who I liked and then I met them all, right. I would pick out completely different people. Right. It's For me, it's like I get attracted to people based off of who they are. Mm-hmm. And I can be loves who they are and maybe not be romantically attracted it just I don't even know what the algorithm is <laughs> it just right. happens right no it's a uh, yeah coming into your authentic self and then just expressing like your likes it almost feels like it's hard to simplify that into statements like all of that like emotions and just like the fluidity and I guess being fluid in between your feminine and masculine energy and then sexuality as well and sexuality as well I think that's important to like early on to you know not put taboo restrictions around I think there's like a certain way to do it like as you're growing in your like adolescence years but to say like no that's wrong you shouldn't think that also does like some damage in itself and I think like me you know being going to like private like Catholic schools like definitely made me feel okay I you know is there something wrong and it's almost like that no, there's there's nothing wrong for you know wanting to love who you love it's being in texas is weird you know i'm happy to see that there's a, a pride festival still and you know that we, we still they, have have a space <laughs> are they gonna do something at fair park this year i actually heard um, music playing earlier so i think they're doing the music series today and oh. then the parade is tomorrow afternoon oh nice nice mm-hmm. now i feel mm-hmm. like i've been to san francisco and seattle gay pride and here it's so family friendly it is very family friendly here <laughs> yeah i mean sometimes people i've been sent videos by family members about mm-hmm. like like people being sexual out in public and there's children around or whatever and i'm like man the dallas pride festival is just so family friendly it's like nothing like that yeah it's very conservative here I think there's like there can be family oriented events but Mm -hmm. then there can be like you know those pride events where you know there's 
like no restrictions. You can just freely just like express your, you know, and a lot of that is like queer fashion. And a lot of that has like taboo, like connotations to it. But at the end of the day, it's just like fashion a form of expression, like, you know. Yeah, but I guess people get all riled up about the sexuality in yeah. children. But I think that's the responsibility of the parents to decipher like what kind of pride event that is. Exactly. Like take them to, you know, a different event. Like you wouldn't be taking them to like a coyote ugly like saloon and be like, oh, you know, we're here. So I definitely agree there. Yeah, I think it's, they call it child grooming, but it's like the parents, you know, have to decide like what they're going to do with the children. Mm -hmm. And uh, they see it. I mean, I don't know. It gets sticky out there. Everyone's got crazy opinions. I know. The meat is already overly sexualized. It's not just the gays. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but also like heterosexuals are very sexualized as well. And there's a lot of things that happen between heterosexuals, you know, that, that are okay. I'm Maybe they're still taboo and hidden behind closed doors, but it's like the gays that get Actually, I think recently it was a friend posted the Adidas, I guess, like new catalog and then ran off on a tangent about like how it was like grooming. It comes from like satanic like intentions. And I had to call it on like, hey, I actually appreciate this ad because when I was younger, I wanted to dress like this. And so the fact that they're making ads like makes it feel like inclusive. Mm hmm. But, you know, like if you don't like it, you don't have to pay attention to it. But I don't think there's like an underlying like here's a mission to destroy like family values and traditional values. So it's funny to hear like the other side's like take on that. It is definitely interesting. Well, Stephanie, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I really enjoyed learning more about you and your story. And thank you for having me. Are there any upcoming events that you would like to plug? This episode will air July 19th. We do have an upcoming event. So we just announced on August 4th, we're going to do a takeover at Bottle Blonde. So this will be with To The Moon. So I'm excited to have the team out and a shout out to Lawrence for having us out. We're really excited to play. There'll be another couple of dates that we'll be announcing as well. But once those are finalized, stay tuned on our socials and hope you guys will be able to join us. Yeah, I can't wait to attend August 4th. I haven't been to Bottle Blonde. I have. It's been a minute since I have been back, um, but I want to say we'll be on the rooftop. So this will be a rooftop set. Cool. Stay tuned as we will play an unreleased track by Stetra that she's worked on with friends Smooth and Drake Vi. It is currently untitled. All right. Well, thanks guys for listening and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Maybe it's not marriage. Maybe it's love. Well, whatever it is, pray that it never hits you. I've got a feeling love don't have to be the way you say it is.